Grace and peace. Welcome to worship for this Ash Wednesday with me, Pastor Mike Goodwin and Memorial Presbyterian Church. As the season of Lent begins, I want to welcome you to a time of worship as we begin Lent on this Ash Wednesday, answering Jesus' call, follow me. Tonight, we are invited to consider the cost of discipleship and to match Jesus' focus, and intensity in our discipleship. Ash Wednesday, like everything else going on in the world right now, is different. Uh, For starters, you won't leave this service with the mark of ash on your forehead. Uh, The sign of ash will appear. You've, You've seen it in our visuals. You'll hear about it in the music for tonight. But in this time of COVID-19, We don't need ash to remind us of our mortality. We're reminded every day in death counts, in uh, virus cases. We're reminded at every turn right now of how very mortal we are, of how very fragile our lives are. So tonight we claim the promise of our baptisms. We reaffirm our baptism reclaiming the promise that in life and in death, we are not our own, but we belong body and soul to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So I hope that you will have some water available for later in the service to join in this remembrance moment. As we worship tonight, our local mission partner is St. Joe's Food Pantry. We celebrate uh, the work that they are doing to feed hungry people in our community, the efforts that they are going to in this difficult time. So I hope that you will use the MPC Gives link to make a donation through our church to St. Joe's. I'll remind you too that our Lenten study is beginning. Um, It will start Thursday at 7 p.m. I wanna encourage you to either check out the newsletter or contact the church office if you need further details about how to be a part of that study. So as the season of Lent begins, let us begin in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, you hate nothing you have made and you forgive our sins. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Help us to return to you and to your way and create in us new hearts so that we might love you more nearly and follow you more closely. Holy God, as we come before you on this day with our Lenten repentances, we remember those sacred words to ash to ash and dust to dust, and yet this year is different. We have lived in the wilderness-like atmosphere of Lent, Lent for nearly a year now. Our world is broken and our hearts are hurting and we need healing and hope. In these broken places, O God, let your healing love seep in. In places where we hurt, even amid this pandemic wilderness, allow healing grace to slowly enter our hearts and lives. In this gloomy season, may we live into the healing that is so desperately needed. May we trust in your holy hope as we remember our mortality. As we venture deeper into the wilderness, help us know that you, your transforming presence will guide us through to the joy of the resurrection with newfound wholeness. Bid us follow, Lord Jesus. Help us to come after you. We pray in your name. Amen.
Children of God, the early followers of Jesus observed the days of Jesus' passion and resurrection with various signs of devotion. It became their custom to prepare for the celebration of the great mystery of our faith with a season of prayer, contemplation, and fasting. So let us begin this season of Lent with self-examination and repentance. Then let us continue through the season with prayer, fasting, reading, and meditating on God's holy word, opening ourselves to God's call. We begin in silence as we listen for that call from God in our lives, listening in this season of Lent for the ways that Jesus says, follow me. So we take a breath, we listen in silence, and we pray. Almighty God, you have created us from the dust of the earth. Ash is a sign of our mortality, penitence, and humility. May we remember it is only by your grace and love that we receive everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Friends, remember this night that indeed you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But also remember that in life and in death, you belong to God. Trust in your Lord and Savior as you answer the call, follow me this season of Lent. So let us pray. We pray together, first me, then you join. Light of true light. Truth of deepest truth. We find peace in your protection. We find courage in your strength. We find wisdom in your truth. We find hope in your presence. You are our beginning and our end, the first and the last, the forgiver and redeemer of all things. With humble hearts, we worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our creator, redeemer, and God, one God, now and forever. Loving and everlasting God, join with me. Loving and everlasting God, nothing is beyond the reach of your love. You offer forgiveness to all who turn to you in confession, and so we pray together. Forgive us the words we failed to speak and the words we should not have spoken. Forgive us the good we failed to do and the evil we have done. Forgive us the love we have refused to offer and the grudges we have held on to. Create in us clean hearts, O Lord. Forgive our past failures. Amend who we are. Direct whom you would have us become. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Children of God, Hear the good news. Hear and believe anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. 
know that God has forgiven you, so forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Share Christ's peace with one another, with the people you are with, or with the people that you are worshiping uh, through the chat feature. Amen. Let us listen and reflect as the choir calls us into Lent, singing, Sign Us with Ashes. Sign us with ashes, merciful God, children of dust as to dust we and minds and create a quiet space deep within us where our spirit can attend to your word through the work of your spirit may we see you more clearly love you more dearly and follow you more nearly amen the scripture lesson today is luke 9 51 through 62 when the days drew near for jesus to be taken up he set his face to go to jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead of him on their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then he went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, 
and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but, not, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever received an invitation like this? It'll be real easy. It won't take any time at all. Anyone can do it. It'll be hardly a commitment. Maybe it was a request from your local school, PTA, maybe a community volunteer or service organization. It might have even been from the church. Join this committee, be a part of that team. There's nothing to it. It'll be easy. Well, as we hear from Jesus tonight, these aren't the kind of requests coming from Jesus. We can make no mistake that this sort of invitation is not from Jesus. Jesus' words that we have heard read are stark, if not impossible. There is no soft sell. There is no sugar coating with Jesus. If Jesus' infer, uh, invitation to discipleship were a commercial, it would be all the fine print. You know how in these uh, medication commercials, it's like, get your life back. You can do all the things you used to love to do. And then at the end, they give you the really rapid fire, all the possible side effects, how you could die and go blind in one eye. But they say it really fast. It's really fine print. The fine print is all Jesus gives us here in his invitation to discipleship. If we would have read a little bit earlier in this chapter, this is what Jesus says earlier on in Luke 9. He says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and my words, Jesus says, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. When we meet Jesus in this passage, he, we're, we are told that he is set his face to Jerusalem. We are told that Jesus, up until this point, has been going along, inviting disciples. He's been healing. He's been proclaiming the kingdom of God. But here in chapter 9, Jesus takes a turn, and the turn is to Jerusalem. So that between chapter 9 and chapter 19, everything that Jesus does is about getting to Jerusalem. And it's a pretty circuitous route if you follow all those chapters. So it's not necessarily a road map, but it's a purpose map. Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. Jesus has purpose. Jesus has focus. Jesus has intention. And his singular focus, his destination is Jerusalem, where his message and his ministry will provoke the Roman Empire and the religious leaders into conspiring his death. We're told here that his focus is so fixed that as he goes through the land of Samaria, the Samaritans don't want anything to do with him. This is what happens in the first part of this text for tonight. And as we journey towards Lent, Jesus is purposefully, intentionally focused on the cross that lies ahead. And so as this text continues, 
Jesus encounters three people. The first of one says, I'll follow you, Jesus. And Jesus says this bit about how foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to put their head. These three people being drafted into Jesus' march to Jerusalem are asking for deferments. And this first one, it says, I'm willing, but Jesus says, but do you know how hard it's going to be? Do you know that it's going to get uncomfortable at times? Do you know that the life of discipleship is costly? Do you know what you're getting into? Another person comes along and Jesus says, follow me. And this person says, Lord, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus tells him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, proclaim the kingdom of God. And the third, I will follow you, Lord, but let me say goodbye. Let me tell everybody at my house that I'm leaving. And Jesus says this sort of cryptic thing. He says, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks and who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, what Jesus is talking about here is a plow for uh, tilling the soil. But I want us to imagine it as a snow plow because we all are familiar right now. So whether it's your snow blower or the snow plow, you can't operate that piece of equipment go in this direction if your head your intention your focus is behind you you can't focus on what jesus is calling you to do if your focus if your intention is behind jesus says here in effect he's not looking for any part-time disciples to follow Jesus is like following the sun. And everything orbits around him. To follow Jesus is for him to become the center of our universe. Which isn't to say that the concerns that get named here aren't important. In fact, they are important. But that's how much more important what Jesus is inviting them to do, to follow, how much more important that is. Comfort is important. I think, I think of all the people who are caring for loved ones, for aging parents or, or young children or everyone in between, people who are primary caregivers right now. You can believe that if Jesus said, come and follow me, you can believe that every single person would say, but I've got this responsibility, Jesus. I can't, I can't just walk out on my mom or my child. I've got I've to take care of the responsibilities I have. Or you think of all the people who've had to make funeral arrangements and the heavy hearts that they have to hear Jesus say, let the dead bury the dead. These are important concerns. But the message here is they can't be our ultimate concern. You consider all the things that can take up our time and attention and resources, all the things that can become idols that take center stage in our lives, family, work, money, our country, our race, our politics, all the things that we make our center, all the things that we neatly wrap a veneer of Jesus on and call it holy, all the things that we ultimately make into our gods. 
The theologian Paul Tillich talked about having ultimate concern, that every person has an ultimate concern. And whatever that ultimate concern is, whether it is the God who made the heavens and the earth, the God revealed in Jesus of Nazareth, whatever that ultimate concern is becomes our God. I think of all the time and attention we give to things that aren't Jesus. All of those things become our ultimate concern. All of those things become our gods. The word credo usually gets translated as I believe. But what it really means is I give my heart to. I set my heart upon. And it's those things that become our center. It's those things that prevent us from following Jesus when he says, come and follow me. Let me say here that I don't believe that Jesus is as heartless as he sounds in these verses. And yet I do believe he's serious. Because I think he takes seriously those other gods that we give ourselves to. Those other gods that we mistake for Jesus. Or those other gods that we think we're using to serve Jesus, but we're really putting Jesus in service of them. One of the ways that we can look at this is the exchange that Jesus has with his disciples about Samaria. And the Samaritans don't want anything to do with Jesus because he's, he's all about Jerusalem. And the disciples in this very silly moment, they offer to rectify the situation by calling down fire from heaven. And uh, Jesus doesn't laugh at them, we're told, but somehow uh, they think that they, can, uh, that they can command heaven to burn the Samaritans to the ground. And Jesus rebukes them. He rebukes the disciples but not the Samaritans. And I think that's significant because for whatever reason, those Samaritans weren't ready. Those people weren't ready. And as we read later on in the Gospels, as we follow the Acts of the Apostles, eventually those Samaritans do respond. In fact, in just a couple of chapters here, Jesus will tell the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus seems to know when a person is ready. And these three people that can't follow Jesus because there's something else, he seems to think they're more ready than they do. So if you have a sense in your own life that Jesus is, is calling you, follow me. Maybe he thinks you're more ready than you do. So at least in this passage, I think we catch a glimpse that Jesus isn't as heartless as he sounds. His invitation also makes clear that his singular focus towards Jerusalem and all that will unfold there all that that means, what it really means is that he's the Messiah and we aren't. We can't take his place on the cross and no other would-be Savior can or will either. So friends, when Jesus bids us follow me, he also makes a way for us to follow 
and we sometimes crawl and we sometimes sprint and we sometimes take two steps forward and three steps back. But eventually, two steps become a mile and a mile becomes a journey and the journey becomes a community. And Jesus becomes the center. And the things that once felt hard, the things that once felt like loss, the things and demands that pull us in every direction become easier. Until one day, it's just as natural as taking a breath. Just as familiar as one foot in front of the other. And it all begins with a step. It all begins with a response to Jesus' invitation, follow me. So this Lent, take a step. Take two. Make Jesus your center. Hear him calling to you, follow me. So take a step. In just a moment, we're going to reaffirm our baptisms. We're going to go to our center, to the beginning of our life of discipleship. And perhaps in beginning again with baptism, it will help us to take the next step. Because as we remember that in life and in death, we belong to our faithful Savior, Perhaps we will remember his voice, the voice that called us from the very beginning. Follow me. Thanks be to God that Jesus keeps calling. Amen. In baptism, you were joined to Christ and made members of his body. In the community of the people of God, you have learned God's purpose for you and for all creation. You have been nurtured at the table of our Lord and called to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself as the cornerstone. So let us 
profess our faith together, responding to these questions. Friends, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, respond, I do. Who is your Lord and Savior? Confess together, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Who will be Christ's faithful disciples? Obeying his word and showing his love. Respond, I will with God's help. And finally, will you devote yourself to the church's teachings and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers? If so, respond, I will with God's help. As we reaffirm our baptisms, we do so remembering that in these waters we have not only died but risen with Christ. It's within these waters that Christ names us, claims us, bids us follow me, leads us into places we do not yet know, confident that Christ goes with us. So let us pray. Gracious God, by water and the Spirit, you claimed us as your own, cleansing us from sin and giving us new life. You made us members of your body, the church, calling us to be your servants in the world. Renew your people in the covenant you make in baptism. Continue the work you have begun in us. Send us forth by the power of your Spirit to love and serve you with joy and strive for justice and peace in all the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, uphold your people by your Holy Spirit. Daily increase in each one of us your gifts of grace the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit and knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. People of God, remember your baptisms this day and be thankful. Remember them and know that the Holy Spirit is at work within you Thanks be to God as the baptized people of God. Let us pray for the world. Remember your baptisms, friends. Be thankful and use that calling to be a source of courage, encouragement, grace, and peace in this world. Let us pray together. As we pray, I would invite you to respond. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, you would respond, hear our prayers. Holy and merciful God, we confess that the world is not as you created it to be. Hear our prayers for the world and for one another. Our love is imperfect and often fails. Help us to love you with heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We have been deaf to your call to serve. Strengthen us to be of service to those in need. Let all people hear your call to join in building your kingdom of grace among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In our lives, anger, pride, hypocrisy, and patience hinder the life-giving relationships we long for. Restore our broken souls and mend this suffering world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. All around us, self-indulgence, envy, and greed 
lead to the exploitation of others. Help our eyes to impact, to the impact of our desires on the earth and its people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. All around us, fear, prejudice, and contempt for others degrade human life. Stir our hearts with your spirit so we can see that all humanity is created in your image. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. All around us, waste, pollution, destroy your creation. Awaken us to the serious consequences of our actions. Move in us by your spirit to make us better stewards of the earth, which is precious to you. Hear us, O God, as we name silently the ways that we have failed to hear your call, the ways that we have failed to love our neighbors as ourselves, the needs that we carry deepest in our hearts, those things that prevent us from giving you our full time and attention, those things that call, cause us to stumble when you bid us come. We name them before you. We share them with one another as we are able and we trust above all that you hear and you know and you make a way. These things we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends in Christ, as Lent begins, answer the call. Answer the call to follow with all you have 
and all you are. And as our service comes to an end tonight, receive this blessing. Go out into the world, not with ash, but with the waters of your baptism. And go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, friends, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.